Good afternoon, Corky here in Hamilton, Alabama. I moved here almost three years ago. Uh, my wife, Kimberly, uh, came to teach at the ramp, uh, which is a school of ministry, uh, developing into a university. And uh, I was retired and the idea of getting to Northwest Alabama was very attractive to me because a part of my work over the years has been uh, curating blues history. And so living in this area, I'm only a little under three hours from Clarksdale, Mississippi. So uh, I get a chance to go more to the Delta. Uh, I started playing blues music about 1970. So I've been at playing blues for 53 years. Uh, and of course the blues was introduced to us Southeastern boys, you know, via the British invasion. So 1964, the Beatles and Rolling Stones came to America and did press conferences and mentioned Muddy Waters. And of course the Rolling Stones had named their band after one of Muddy Waters songs. But the uh, white boys in the Southeast had very little knowledge about the music because it was considered to be race music and not played on white radio stations. Uh, but we were all living together in the South. And uh, so eventually we were catching up to our heritage of blues music. Also, and you know, gospel moves along with it. Um, the Delta, of course, the areas that I travel in, in that, what I consider to be a sacred area, uh, from Memphis all the way down to, say, uh, Indianola or Greenwood, <clears throat> which is probably considered to be mid-Delta, and then even closer to me here is what's called the Hill Country, around the Oxford, Mississippi area. And I'm learning about the Burnside family and uh, Kimbrough family. And I plan to go to the uh, Hill Country picnic. A lot of people don't know the history, but slaves from Ghana, West Africa collected there in what they call the hill country of Mississippi. And to this day, there is still um, picnics and festivals that feature fife and drum bands, the drum band coming directly from Ghana, band music, drum music from the drum capital of Ghana, West Africa. So I'm still learning about hill country blues um, the particular historical uh, frame that we're looking at here is uh, from the time of slavery into the 30s, 1930s in Mississippi. And a good book for this history is one that I recommend, uh, The Country Blues by Samuel Charters. Now, country blues would be blues that began with acoustic guitar, <clears throat> muddy, as well as Hall and Wolf and a number of others, uh, Charlie Patton, uh, these guys would have begun playing acoustic blues. Robert Johnson and so forth. So the acoustic blues at its height was about the 1930s now. And shortly thereafter, 
uh, two factors led to blacks moving north to work in the factories. One factor was that the railroad was able to take them to Chicago and Detroit from the Delta. Uh, secondly, the technology on the farms. And when we do the tour, the blues tour, we go to uh, Hobson Plantation, which is where Muddy Waters drove tractor, Howlin' Wolf drove tractor, I think. And then we go to these farms, and of course, Parchment Farm Prison, Mississippi State Penitentiary, is a, itself a farm. So these men, Charlie Patton for one, worked on plantation and he also worked in the prison. <clears throat> so this, uh, uh, during this period, it was acoustic blues, which was the beginning, what we call the country blues, right? And then because of the technology that, uh, that replaced like cotton pickers, people picking cotton, the technology that made that automated, you know, and modernized, uh, put a lot of the blacks out of jobs uh, in Mississippi. And so they, they migrated north to cities like Detroit, Chicago, St. Louis, some of them work in the car factories, and you hear this among the uh, African-American blues players in these documentaries like The Wrecking Crew, or not so much that, because that's the West, but the Muscle Shoals, and then uh, especially Standing in the Shadows of Motown, that documentary, if you haven't seen that about the um, Funk Brothers, they were individuals who were from Mississippi for the most part, African-American <clears throat> who moved uh, to uh, Detroit for the automobile factories to work in it. And then because of the prosperity they experienced there, they were able to buy horns or add horns to the bands. And then the, the country acoustic blues got kind of replaced by electric blues. So that when Muddy Waters and Alan Wolf and, all of them were breaking in the Chicago blues. It was a blues that was a band blues that was uh, uh, utilizing electric guitars and and uh, horns and things like that. <clears throat> in between that time, bands had begun in uh, Northeast Mississippi and in that area, Memphis, uh, Tennessee, they were jug bands. So that were the next step from country blues of just playing blues on a acoustic guitar. The next step is to add, you know, washboard, uh, harmonica, add a kazoo, add a mandolin, which mandolin had already been a part of acoustic blues prior to that time, but there were jug bands. And jug bands in America are equivalent to skiffle bands in England. Most of you know, if you know Beatle history, you know that John Lennon played in a skiffle band. A skiffle band was a country acoustic band. Uh, and so when you see John Lennon doing these uh, strums on his Rickenbacker, when the Beatles come to America, like in All My Lovin', he's actually doing banjo type rhythms, and that would have come from his orientation to skiffle music in England. So skiffle in England and drug bands in America were the precursor bands to what would become rock and roll and blues, or blues and rock and roll. Uh, so um, this area of Mississippi, when you research that, if you go on one of my blues tours, which I've done, I don't know, seven or eight of them, over the years, educators come down here and I take them to the uh, cemeteries, the churches, um, locations of the old juke joints and the um, 
museums that are, are in Mississippi. There's a great one in Clarksdale called the Delta Blues Museum. There's now a Grammy Museum in Greenville, Mississippi. And then there's a small museum in Leland, Mississippi, which features Johnny Nigger Winter, because their dad was a mayor there. And people come and we travel for one full day up and down the Mississippi Delta and we go to these sites. Um, so we're talking about towns like Clarksdale, which was the, the hometown of Muddy Waters and uh, and of course, Robert Johnson played there a lot. B.B. King, Indianola, we go to Indianola to the great B.B. King Museum. So message me or contact me if you think you're interested in going on one of these tours. I don't charge a great deal for them. Just ask that you give me some gas money when we leave out of like Memphis. You could get to Memphis and we could do it all the way down. And that night we end up in Greenwood, Robert Johnson's grave. Um, these sites are maintained, a lot of them, and also the museum in Chicago, uh, to Chess Records, um, is maintained to a large degree by people like the Rolling Stones and uh, other rock people who trace their origins to American blues. Ronnie Wood's very involved in the Chess Records Museum um, I think they call it Blues Heaven, uh, and it's, it's focused around, uh, a few players, uh, and so, um, uh, this is the idea of the progression of blues history, uh, beginning in the slave railroad haulers, field haulers, Alan Lomax came down here with his his dad had been down, and then he came down with the, you know, recorder in his trunk of his car and gave us a lot of the Library of Congress recordings of the early blues singers. And so in the Mississippi Delta, that is country blues country. I mean, they did come back and play electric down there, and they play electric blues there today. Um, I'm told in Clarksdale that there's live music every single day. And so, um, but anyway, these are some thoughts on those that are interested in studying the background of, uh, of American blues and rock and roll. And, uh, I'll probably say some other things later, but I'm trying to make these videos as short as possible. I, a lot of these things I thought would end up in a book that I would write, but I ended up doing one book on Native Americans and uh, I'm not planning to write another book. And so in the day in which we live, YouTube and things like that, it gives me an opportunity to put thoughts down that would normally be an article or a chapter and make it universally available to people. That's the one advantage of this medium. So um, have a great day.